Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, all learners from Emeritus and Eruditus. We are here for our guest lecture series by Kaiyas Services. I'm Shivam, and I'll be moderating this session. Today we have with us Neha Gupta, the HR director from Pfizer, and our topic for today is importance of communication in remote work era. Uh, hi, Neha, how are you doing? Hello, and thank you, Shivam, and the entire team for having me here. Really, really, you know, I feel humbled to be here. So uh, guys, if you have any question during the session, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll bring them up during the end of our uh, session. Uh, it gives me a, a pleasure to introduce Megha to all of you. Uh, with 15 plus years of experience across Fortune 500 companies, Megha has worked for organizations in financial technology, US-based IT services, telecom and radio sector. Areas of expertise in strategic uh, business partnership, organizational development, leadership development, talent management, performance management, diversity and inclusion, compliance and employee engagement. He has worked extensively with teams across US, Europe, APAC and India. Uh, she has uh, received recognitions uh, for past few years. Uh, she has received HR Leader Award by People Matters, I in the list 2016, HR 40 and 40 Award by Peter Group Business World 2020. Most Innovative Leader Award by World HRD Congress 2021. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me uh, put Neha on and uh, we can start the session. Sure, so I would just say, you know, thank you so much. And I you know, I don't know how many uh, participants are there today, but uh, I think I'm looking forward for this conversation uh, with all of you. The format that we have uh, decided is to make it more interactive rather than, you know, one way uh, conversation today, uh, which means, you know, we'll have some questions, you know, that this team has decided pre-planned. And in between, we'll absolutely use some of the questions that each one of you would want to hear, would want to know. Uh, and, you know, the intent is to keep two-way communication. The intent is to uh, not just hear about the topic of communication in a one fashion, but, uh, you know, keep it interactive, learn from each other. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, I'm sure I will learn uh, a lot from each one of you post this session. So absolutely delighted for next 50 minutes, uh, you know, to share with this team. Uh, so let me start with one of the questions that I already have. Uh, so uh, first, the uh, very basic question, like uh, uh, what everyone is thinking. Uh, do you think this remote working has impacted our ability to communicate well within team, uh, amongst teams? Uh, do you think uh, like uh, it has put any hindrance to our uh, communication ability? So great question, Shivam. Uh, you know, and let me step back. You know, while we're starting this conversation about the hybrid workplace, I think let me start with the context to say that you know the you know in April twenty fifth, twenty twenty, when all of this had happened, uh, had happened, I don't think so. The world had planned for a complete lockdown, or India had planned for a complete lockdown. I don't think so. Anybody was prepared to see a hybrid, or you know, to see where we are of two years working from home. But having said that, I feel, you know, if I go back in time, uh, those initial two months were extremely, extremely difficult for everyone. Uh, I don't think so. Organizations, even large technology organizations were prepared for a complete work from home. Nobody had experienced, you know, everybody across the globe sitting at home and, you know, using a laptop as a mode of medium rather than sitting in a meeting room. Uh, interviews, I think uh, the biggest one, uh, you know, the very common feature every time was in interview has to be in person. We barely might have one round over a telephonic or a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting, but mandatory, you know, there were rounds in person to ensure that, you know, you are interacting in person because there's a lot that goes in person, which is your body language, uh, which is ensuring there is authentic conversations to ensure that, you know, how people behave in a, in a setting in the office workplace. I think that completely, you know, seized you know, during the time of pandemic and nobody knew how to deal with it while everybody adopted to the model of, you know, working through teams or working through Zooms or multiple other channels of communication. But I think it was tough. I think the first six months was really tough for HR leaders, were really tough for business leaders to operate in that model and space. And I think communication evolved over time in the pandemic, uh, you know, as pandemic progressed and as we all got uh, you know, used to the fact of working in a hybrid model. Now, I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, 
everybody went to zoom you know interview started to happen through zoom and teams and couple of other mediums and while all of that happened uh, i think the biggest uh, you know organizations started to do training programs for managers how to take programs over a zoom meeting or a teams meeting how do you start to look for a body language into a teams meeting but imagine a candidate nobody was training the candidate and that's how tough it was for a normal person now somebody who's sitting in a campus is suddenly not trained or equipped to have a zoom conversation or an interview now those who are teaching those people to have a zoom conversation uh you know how do you decide that you know in this conversation uh you know uh, what am i going to look for because you know when a candidate comes to a office premises you know he looks for vibes he looks for that cultural sense when they enter the office uh now that was completely missing so i feel everybody had to go through a lot when it comes to communication piece uh, you know while the hybrid model is still evolving and i'm sure it's going to be a lot uh evolution still to come now imagine uh, tomorrow you know if your 50% of the team is working from home and 50% of the team is in office how are you going to whiteboard it in a meeting room because half of your team would be in the meeting and half of the team would be in the teams i think if you feel that you know we've gone past the complexity the complexity is yet to come is what i would say because now you will have to figure out oh i should i use a whiteboard that's in the conference room or should i still continue to use on the teams uh, and type there as a white coding now if you do that then what's the point of everybody sitting in the conference room so i think you know complexity is just going to increase from here uh uh we still in a phase where you know communication has still to go to a lot level of how do we make more collaborative how do we ensure that you know everybody's on the same pace because i think uh, the floor that we were sitting on suddenly the floor has sinked i would say and we are building uh, now new flows we're figuring out whether it should be circular or triangle or square uh, so i feel that you know uh, it definitely dropped but i think uh, in 18 months everybody learned through this but i feel there is a lot more changes that you know we should expect as hybrid model is going to evolve in multiple uh, organizations that's true uh, and and hybrid model is going to come like it's it's inevitable is as you were talking about remote hiring uh, like people going to uh, interviews through zoom they are not prepared so they will talk about campuses or literal hiring as well uh, people are uh, still there are few things that uh, as a uh, as a recruiter you look for in an interview uh, it, uh, like uh, looking at an interviewer so uh, uh, how do people increase their chances of getting selection in uh, in remote interviews uh, what tips do you have for them yeah great question shivam uh, you know and this is irrespective of a hybrid or in person because very soon in person interviews will start right in next 6 to 8 months i feel that the in person interviews will also start to happen uh i think you know shivam if i have to interview a candidate i'll be very honest three things that i look forward in a candidate is first you know the first you know and you know i'll tell you what in the first 30 seconds of how you interact in an interview decide you know uh whether the interviewer is going to run the interview or you are going to run the interview and i'm honest about this okay uh and i'll give you an example okay very simply 80% of the time the interviewer asks the first question is okay why don't you take me towards your journey of the organization or what have you done now that's the basic question every interviewer asks and that's what you know i would say as a tip to each one of you prepare and go for that question and exactly think about what are the two biggest challenges examples uh outcome anything that you have done is that you want to share and trust me you know 90% of the time the interviewer will have a follow up question on exactly what you shared uh, and now think about who's running and driving the interview is it you or is the interviewer so i think that's my first tip to for all of you to think about prepare those first 20 minutes or first 15 minutes of the interview because that's going to decide whether you are you driving that uh, or the interviewer is driving that so i think that's my first tip of any interview that you go to uh, you know go forward for the second piece you know communication is very important and i keep telling that again and again uh, because how you communicate uh, you know if you 
especially if you're going for an MNC interview. Communication is extremely, extremely important on you know how you communicate. Because imagine your MNC would expect you to interact with multiple partners, multiple clients based out of multiple geographies, even stakeholders based out of US or any other geography. So communication becomes very key. I'm not saying be great into analogies or you know English. But I'm saying, you know, be clear and crisp on what you communicate. I think that's more important than just the language that you are using. So keep that in mind. Prepare yourself on what kind of words and examples and, you know, outcomes that you're sharing during the interview. So that's the second piece. My third piece, which I give, uh, you know, as a piece of advice, if you are starting your career, if you're joining from a campus, you know, everybody has the same resume. You know, how are you going to differentiate yourself? You know, talk about any, you know, initiative that you took in your campus life or in your first two years of your career. Talk about that initiative and don't don't just talk about the initiative. Talk about why did you start doing that? What was the challenge or the problem statement that you were looking forward? Uh, how did you overcome that? And what do you learn from that? You know, the moment you start that example with what was the business problem or the challenge, how did you overcome it and what did you personally learn for it? I am telling you, the, you know, your 80% of your interview is on your side and that's how you should think about, you know, uh, adapting for an interview. Now you apply it in person, you apply it hybrid, I think you are going to come very, very successful from that conversation. Uh-huh. All right, Shiv- uh, Shivam, I think I am hearing a lag in your voice. Is it just me? Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, can you hear me now properly? Yes, I can. So, uh, let me take you to the third uh, part of this. Like, uh, uh, so we have talked about uh, as a whole, like uh, about organizations, about careers. Uh, so, let me talk about something different now. Uh, so, usually in offices, you see that uh, uh, there is a great deal of learning. And uh, is attained through colleagues. Uh, so, how do we improve peer learning during remote uh, working, like uh, during this era? Great question, Shivam. And I think uh, this is the biggest challenge that HR heads are yet to solve for, I would say. Uh, see, when you are in the office space, you know, it's very easy for walk to a peer group or interact with them or hear into a group conversation on what's happening figure out how the culture of the organization, you know, it's very easy to walk in through people's cabin or, you know, to their desk and, you know, just interact, have a coffee break or have, you know, typically what we call is a water cooler conversations, right? Now in a hybrid model or, you know, or, you know, complete work from home model, it's absolutely, absolutely very, very difficult because for everything you expected to block time, for everything you are expected to be on a team or make a call to that individual. And, you know, if the person is not picking up, you don't know if the person is generally not become picking up because they don't want to talk to you or they're busy and then you have your own apprehensions to reach out to somebody that you don't know in the organization as well so i think that's a real challenge that organizations are facing uh, you know some organizations have started to use a lot of collaborative tools like teams is one of the examples which gives you a lot of pieces on collaboration whether you can create a team channel which typically look, works like a whatsapp you can talk you can chat you can like you can uh, share emojis you typically work like that to even you know collaborating neurons and balls and there are multiple tools that organizations are really thinking about even for whiteboarding there are multiple tools like uh, neurons that organization has start to use but having said that you know as human beings you know we still uh, you know there are as we have five hands there are different personality types you know somebody would be extrovert and don't mind you know just pinging somebody uh, with, with somebody like me who's an introvert uh, may not absolutely go out and you know ping somebody to say hey, i need help so i think that's the challenge that organization have which means you'll have to really go out to say, do you have a mentorship culture in the organization, which is beyond the people managers? How do you uh, ensure that, you know, people feel it is a safe place to go and reach out and ask for help? And that's a more cultural nuances that organization will have to start and put together a lot more as your values, as how people come across from a cultural standpoint. And I think it's a real challenge for organizations to really solve for uh, Shiva. 
That's true. Like the, this is a challenge, and everyone is facing like new joinees, the uh, current employees, anyone who is in the company, they are facing. And uh, yeah, I like the idea of having a mentor uh, with you when when someone joins. Uh, that that can actually uh, be a nice break. Uh, so we have a couple of questions uh, on the chat and uh, as well on the uh, uh, So Bimal is asking how do I macro manage remote employees? How do I micro manage remote employees? So Vimal, I would uh, absolutely say uh, micromanaging at whether it's remote or it's physical is not advisable. And I'll be very honest, Vimal, uh, people thrive, you know, when you give them space, people thrive when, uh, you know, you believe and trust in them. The whole idea of remote working or hybrid working will only be successful when you as a people manager are going to build that trusted relationship with your teams or your peers or your employees. So I would absolutely say Vimal micromanaging, you know, is only advisable in case the person is a poor performer uh, or, you know, is not up to the mark. But absolutely as an individual, I would say micromanagement, uh, I would, you know, say just avoid as much as you can. You know, what you rather have to do is to focus on the task and the quality of the work that you give to the individual and rather leave to that individual to come back. Set expectation. I'll give you, you know, instead of micromanaging and asking questions around, how did you arrive at that? Why don't you give it to me now? You know, set expectations at the right at the start. Hey, this is the delivery that I expect you to give. Uh, what time do you think you would be coming back to me? You know, ask those questions and set expectations at the start and let that person figure out. You know, ask questions. Do you need any help for me to help you to arrive at this situation? Let individual ask for help rather than you providing help uh, at every step of the individual. Because when you handhold too much, Pimal, what also happens is the individual is completely under your shadow. Uh, the new generation, especially the millennial generation, wants to do independently, want to explore different ideas rather than being, you know, told everything on how to do. I would rather say, you know, give them the whole picture of why are we doing this? Where do we want to arrive from, you know, the project that you are? Let them figure out how they want to do. Organizations do have the resources, you know, you will have the tools to arrive at that. If they need training, provide them the training, but let them do on their own. Set the right expectation if timelines is a challenge for you, uh, rather than really micromanage. So I think that would be my response to that, Vimal. Uh, we have a question from Kalpana. Uh, she's asking remote working is more challenging for new joinees to deal with the learning curve both in terms of the company culture and domain. Pani is asking a similar question. How do you think this hybrid model is working for new employees, especially uh, refreshers joining immediately after college? Yeah. So, uh, I think, you know, again, real challenge, I think a lot of organizations are facing and with technology uh, organizations booming, uh, there is a huge focus on the campus hires. There are going to be a lot more campus hires in this year as well as in the next year. So, great question, Imani, I would say, and a couple of others who have asked this. Uh, I think what you need to do is, uh, you know, while, you know, people are going to struggle because they haven't seen the office space, they haven't seen how culturally you operate as an organization, uh, uh, you know, the best ways to do is have a robust onboarding program, Himani. Uh, even start before they even join, which is, you know, keep them warm from a pre-onboarding standpoint. Send them organization material, which is around policies, which is around culture. How great is your culture for the organization? Send them material before in hand for them to get equipped with the organization culture itself. Uh, have a robust onboarding. Earlier, if you were doing a one-day robust onboarding program, think about three days or four days onboarding program and talk a lot about, you know, what's okay to do in the organization. What is not okay to do as an organization? Like, you know, in my previous organization, uh, you know, if you don't ask questions, people will think something is wrong with you. Either you, do, you don't know what's happening 
or you know you completely are out of the sync of the organization culture because the organization is extremely open in collaboration and they used to encourage more and more people asking questions so you know the first thing that we used to tell in the induction program was hey it's okay to fail but it's not okay for you to try new thing or to ask questions and we used to you know ensure that the onboarding was set that way so that people get that this is a very very different culture of the organization i think you have to imbibe that in into a virtual setup through examples through case studies through a you know even play a game with them to say how will you deal with a situation give them a real life situation that they face and see what kind of responses they come up with and say hey great you are in the right trajectory but in this organization we encourage you to be more collaborative we don't like individual superheroes we like group superheroes talk about it if collaboration is extremely important in, about uh, in your organization if uh you know coming to an innovation idea is extremely important or a core value for you then talk about hey you know we don't want people who just come and do the job description that we have given to you we want people who can come and you know define a job description for themselves which means how innovative you know either you do things uh, you do the current things differently or you come and do different things in the organization set that tone in the induction and the onboarding program so that would be my second advice for you to think about uh, you know different ways of encouraging that culture nuances because people are not able to see that the third thing that i would say is assign a buddy to these new hires especially people who are coming from corporates and let that buddy you know be of the same peer group rather than being somebody senior so that they can start you know getting you know used to new things in the organization they start you know uh, share more things in the organization they start to make friend in the organization and i would say that it's extremely important for somebody to gel somebody to you know able to reach out and ask questions even it is as stupid as hey i don't know how to uh, use x feature in teams or how to use an x feature in microsoft those questions will come to a new hire especially from campus so have that buddy program uh, so that you know people can are not fear to go and reach out and ask stupid questions as well i would say so i think those would be my piece of advice Thanks, Mika. For this, uh, we have a question from Suraj. Uh, he is asking scope of hybrid model in sales and marketing. Great question, Suraj. So, Suraj, you know, let me, you know, on that question, give you a stats. Okay. Now, uh, as per Cisco, uh, you know, they predict that you know the work is never going to be the same. And you know, when I say that, you know, they even say that you know, fifty percent of uh the organization or you know the overall population in you know organizations uh only expect people to be in office for 10 days or even less uh, less in a month so that's the prediction cisco is doing the second prediction that they're doing is 90% 98% believe that the future meetings will include remote participants and this included sales and marketing by the way in the data imagine 98% believe that future meetings will include remote participants rather than in person participants uh and you know obviously 97% of respondents said that you know they want to make change safer before when they return which is just before they even move to an office space even which is 10 days or less we obviously expect a safer work environment for them to go back to office now why i'm saying this as a study because you know this is not something that i'm saying this is the world and the fortune 500 ceos are talking about uh which is saying that you know they fundamentally believe that 50 50% of the travel uh you know the work travel is going to uh, you know never going to come back you know only 50% of the travel is going to come back into 2023 or even beyond uh which means including sales and marketing you would expect a lot of meetings to happen virtually now i'll give you an example okay we still have our you know a lot of global clients do you think we don't meet them but pandemic does stop us to go to us or even within us to go and meet our clients but the meetings are happening virtually and we are getting new clients and so are so many other it organization getting new clients 
I think the world has got accustomed to the fact in the last 18 months that virtual meetings are okay. No matter it's about di- signing a deal or to meet a CEO of the company, uh, which is going to be a huge sale for the organization. I think the world had got used to it, and we all have to also, you know, believe in this new reality to say to say that yes, the, you would face people still to say, oh, I want in-person meeting. But at the same time, you would also see now a very, very reality of saying uh, yes, virtual meetings are also okay, which means international travel is also going to be very, very limited in the near future, and that's also going to be a new reality for all of us. The next question is from Ahmed Nadeem. Uh, he is asking. being remotely connected how do we convincingly communicate to senior management if any process is not heading in the right direction excellent and uh again you know when you are remote i do understand that you know uh, you feel that uh, you know maybe what you're communicating is not going through so i would say you know think about uh, what's the challenge not for you but for the organization that you're solving for you have to sometimes step back in a remote setup from your aspect of what you're doing to what are you solving for the organization and create that business case before you go to the people manager to say hey this is the problem that we are facing whether it's operations whether it's cost whether it's man hours whether it's automation whatever problem that you're solving for and then talk about the fact that hey uh, you know because of this problem if we do these 10 things this is the outcome or success measure that we're going to achieve out of this which may be cost reduction which may be man hours reduction which may be just automating a piece of a process or x y z and get a buy in to that don't solve everything and go to your boss boss don't do that you know organizations don't expect you to solve everything and come you know talk about the idea first and say this is what the problem is this is what we're going to do and this is what we're going to achieve align your leaders to that idea first of all let them you know tone it apart give you suggestions maybe completely change the course but get that attention to say hey i have an idea and by doing that this is what you're going to get and listen to what the leaders are saying because sometimes they are they are into a large huge setup than what you are doing and they have a lot more context to what you're saying and sometimes don't you know take that personally and emotionally say oh i had a great idea but you know it was ripped apart in the meeting but rather listen to what they're saying you know because you know sometimes picking from there will give you another idea to say hey maybe i'll change it to 30% 50% or 70% and i still be able to achieve what i was saying uh, and just picking from those nudges from what leaders say you will still be able to do something very different but something very very meaningful for the organization so listen a lot when you're presenting and you know seek for those help to the leaders to say what do you think uh, is it a good idea is it a bad idea should we do things differently should we involve somebody else from the team you know be very very open to ideas suggestions and help that the leadership team will offer the third thing that you have to do is you know whenever you come from a meeting and have a you know successful idea or have an alignment you have to keep a traction on it you cannot then you know be silent for two months and then after two months go and say hey i have done this so everybody has forgotten about it so you have to keep a traction on a weekly basis to say this is what we have done in a week this is where we have gone and these are the next couple of things that we are going to do on a every week basis show that progress show that every week a traction of what's happening if you want to call for a meeting call for a meeting on a weekly basis but do that or send it over a email from a project management standpoint this is what the project is this is our scope this is our the timeline and this is what we have achieved every single week have that every week check in update whatever you want to do and do that and then obviously you know slowly gradually take baby steps to arrive at that i think the moment you do that i think that's automatically bring a lot of visibility to you second uh, secondly the leaders have your you know full attention to say hey uh, this person you know just not solve for a problem but understand where is it coming from a business standpoint and also keep you know a proper channel of communication with the leadership team to keep them updated on what's happening so i think that would be my piece of advice shiva <laughs> Mm-hmm.
Uh, so the next question that we have is from Jitesh Nair. Uh, he's asking, as the trend might move to hybrid working model, are you expecting any change to the policies, labor laws, and employee safety norms? If yes, what would be the changes that we can pose? Great question. Um, I don't know how many of you, uh, you know, are very, very active, uh, you know, reading about what's happening in the industry. Uh, but any of you heard about a very recent thing that Google did on the compensation, which means people who are opting for permanent work from home, their compensation will be decided by the location that they stay in. Say, for example, if the work location was in New York and the person is sitting out of at uh, is working out of Atlanta then the compensation is going to be different than the person who is in New York and their base location was supposed to be New York. So they're going to have a you know, city-based compensation even if you're working from home. Uh, that's to obviously adjust to the place that you work with. So is the place that you stay obviously have a different uh, 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 allowance slash, uh, I would say, the, you know, the expenses that you would incur as for the city. Now, that's a, you know, completely uncalled, I think, uh, very, very pioneer in the industry uh, that has come up suddenly that nobody was expecting for. Uh, there are companies like TCS who have called for, oh, by 2025, we will be 75% completely remote. So I think the industry is yet to see a lot that's going to happen from a hybrid standpoint. I think it's just the business. We haven't even seen what's going to happen in the hybrid. Uh, companies are experimenting. Uh, many companies are just being laggards to say that, oh my God, we're just going to wait and watch. We don't know what to do. We'd rather just wait and watch how the industry is going. Uh, from a labor law standpoint, absolutely. I mean, even if hybrid is not going to come, we are expecting a lot of labor changes. And by the way, you know, uh, it's already there. Like, you know, if I talk about uh, Karnataka, there is a very different uh, compliance labor laws coming up for hybrid model. That means you can only get 30% of the workforce to some states coming up saying you can have only 50% of the workforce in the office. To some states are completely open. Oh, you can call 100% of your workforce from now. So I think absolutely labor laws are going to be uh, a big factor in driving a lot around how the hybrid will work, non-work. Uh, and that too state-wise rather than even a geography-wise. But at the same time, I think hybrid will have a lot different uh, nuances for every different organization. And I feel we haven't seen even the 10% right now. Trust me, you know, you will see a lot difference in next one year, different organizations coming up with different, different mechanisms. The next question is from Ashish. Ashish asking few companies are moving towards four day work week. As an HR, how you see it? Will the productivity of employees be improved? Because they'll be able to if they'll be able to manage their personal life well. I think Shivam, uh, personally if you ask me, uh, if an organization offers me to work 12 hours every day and move to a four day week, I think I would be the most happy person. I think absolutely and there is a huge study you know you were you read world economic forum you read multiple other psychological studies it absolutely says the more that you spend on your emotional mental and physical well-being your productivity is going to be double uh, to what you spend you know six days a week or seven days a week or even a five days week so there are enough studies to and proof to you know say that a four day working week is absolutely going to help organizations improve productivity now the question is how uh, how many organizations adopted i think very recently there was one organization technology startup organization that has come up with a four day week i think switzerland and netherlands have already moved to four days a week as a country uh, that they have started and encouraging that uh, i think a lot of organizations have started doing flexible work policies as an option which means you know uh, a returning woman or uh, you know even people you know who has uh, individual choices can move to a you know four day work week or even a three day work week or four, half a day kind of a thing so organizations are moving but it's still as a benefit that organizations are providing rather than a policy change completely as the whole organization moving to a four day policy 
I think there's a lot of merit. Personally, I feel that. Personally, I would like to do that, and my team also would love to, you know, be a four-day work week. Uh, but I feel as a, a, a nation, or even you know, multiple countries, I see, still see that as a benefit more than completely moving to a four-day work week. We have a couple of questions uh, from the healthcare uh, point of view. I chat earlier. These most of views on telemedicine. Uh, that was from Dr. Vivek Gupta. Uh, we have one question from Nitin Bash. Uh, he's asking from touch therapy to touch pad. How is remote working gonna work in healthcare, especially in relation? Patient care and treatment. Sorry, Shivam, your voice is breaking. Can you repeat that question? Yes, so Nitin is asking uh, from touch therapy to touch pad, how is remote working gonna work in healthcare, especially in relation to patient care and treatment? Great question. I think uh, excellent. I think I'm very impressed with the you know questions that are coming up. Uh, so I would say, uh, you know, first of all, I think. Uh, and I'm quoting a fact from again the World Economic Forum, and I'm a big fan of them. The kind of studies they come up with, uh, you know, the maximum evolution that has happened in the healthcare industry in the last two years of pandemic has not happened in the last 30 to 50 years, and that's a fact, by the way. Uh, you know, the amount of investments that countries are doing in research as well as the healthcare industry, uh, that kind of a fund and the investment we have not seen in the multiple years uh, previously. In fact, there is a study that also says uh, that uh, in the next five years, the healthcare industry will be fundamentally very different to what we have been historically used to how the healthcare industry is. Now, that's a big shift that you would see in the healthcare industry. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the April month, uh, my entire family got infected, which is obviously the peak time of uh, the second wave of Corona that happened. Uh, I had a extremely good specialist uh, uh, from Delhi Fortis Hospital, a very, 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 very senior specialist uh, from Fortis. Every single day, you know, even those 14 days, 15 days, I never visited to hospital. Uh, the entire 15 days, the, you know, doctor interacted with us uh, through WhatsApp video call and used to check each and every family member of ours, all five of us, six of us through WhatsApp video call, uh, ask us symptoms, look at our face, including my three-year-old daughter, uh, everything. Did we? Did I ever expect that a year ago for a WhatsApp video call into a disease like which is you have seen the morality rate of this disease, right? Uh, we have never seen that or expected that, and that's the reality of the healthcare industry today. Uh, very very senior specialist doctors have already started to teleconsult already, and that's a big shift due to pandemic that has happened. Uh, now, you know, a lot of big, you would see platforms coming up in the healthcare industry, which will ask you, which will actually work like a chatbot to talk about what are your symptoms today. And basis that it will already give you a report to the doctor. And then doctor will at a prescribed time, will just do a teleconversation with you to understand your symptoms and probably provide and start a course treatment to do. So you don't have to travel to US for a X disease or a Y disease. That's going to be a new reality from, you know, technology standpoint. The second piece, you know, that's happening revolutionary in the healthcare industry is there are going to be, you know, apps on your mobile or even to the fact chips that's going to record your physical movement, your heart rate, your blood rate, uh, to everything that you do or you intake on a daily basis basis that they're going to keep a medical record for you. India would be a little different in terms of adopting this technology, but at least in the US, it's going to be a very much reality in coming up future. Uh, and basis that track record, you know, it would already feed into a database of the organization and they will predict, oh, is this person going to have a heart attack in the next six months? Or if this person is diabetic uh, and this person has skipped the medicine for two days, what's going to happen in the next three days? And that's kind of a predictive uh, 
model in the healthcare industry is going to be the next new normal and it will obviously come up in the us india may take a little bit or a lot more time to adopt to that technology but that's going to be a new reality from a healthcare standpoint and there are multiple technology organizations working on it from applications to uh, ai based modules to chatbot uh i already spoke about tele uh, consulting so even uh, you know robot surgery is going to be a very very common thing by the way you will have less surgeons even surgeons sitting out of a remote location and remote surgery is happening to a patient is also going to happen very very soon so i think healthcare industry is fundamentally sitting on a place where we will see a transformation in the next 5 years Uh, we have one question from uh, Shamir Shambhu. Uh, he's asking: uh, Most of the companies have internal job postings (IJPs), uh, but most of the time, employees are unable to join or apply as they question with their immediate reporting gets sol- uh, solved. Uh, most of the time, if you apply, then it becomes difficult to work at present workplace as immediate supervisor really go starts considering the talented junior as a threat or extra. so shivam uh, you know we have seen this i think uh, if you are doing that uh, you know if you genuinely want to apply for a position because your heart is there in that position don't think about your current you know you know have a heart to heart conversation don't get into a conflict or a mod oh, you know let me go otherwise i will leave the organization don't get there have a heart to heart conversation with your manager and say hey this is you know this is my career and i genuinely want to you know do this because of x y z reason because i aspire to be here in next few years i see in this organization uh please leave me you know what i'm going to promise you is this is going to provide me a career and i will never be more thankful to you for giving me that space trust me when you have that emotional conversation or a heart to heart chat with your manager you know there is 60% chance the manager will really leave you and stick to that he will give you a convincing story he will say hey i will give you a promotion i will give you that he said say that you know i'm not looking for a promotion i'm genuinely looking for my career to grow i genuinely want to learn there and i personally feel it's going to be a great career choice to me in 6 months if i don't feel i'm getting uh, what i'm you know supposed to get i promise i'll reach back to you and you know i am sure you are my mentor you have given me x y z things i can't be more thankful to that uh, and i'll come back to you and i hope you will provide me that set those expectation be very very firm of where you want to go but have that heart to heart talk rather than getting into the fact oh this is my fundamental right to go to a next level and this is my fundamental right to be into some place don't do that uh, rather you know build that connection leverage that connection so that tomorrow if you in a bad spot that manager is ready to take you back as well build that relationship you know organizations you know while you have processes you have policies you always have an escalation board which is hr if something doesn't work out for you but you know i would always encourage people to build relationship organization always works on relationship more than anything else Ten more minutes. Uh, questions. Uh, Vipresh, uh, Vipresha is asking, how is the government job space evolving in terms of work culture as compared to MNC culture? How much technically equipped is India in adopting hybrid work models for government jobs? Great question. Actually, I'm not following government, so I may not be completely well versed, and you know, I don't shy away from saying that. Uh, So I have seen, uh, you know, a lot of government jobs have changed, uh, and I'll give you an example, right? Uh, in my, you know, one of the organizations that I work for, HCL, and HCL was, you know, primarily had a big chain uh, where they used to have only the government projects, and that's how I know that, you know. government has reserved a lot of fund for technology slash transformation that they want to do see the challenge that the government has it's not about the fund or it's not about the intent i think the challenge that they have is the pace of the change that they you know really make that happen uh, uh even sometimes you know i don't want to use the word politics or you know the budget or just thinking about going for uh 
you know not so great quality of a product or a technology also faces the challenge in terms of adopting to the new face i feel they have their heart is in the right place uh, that's what i would say because they do adopt a lot of technology recent ones like you know if you think about uh, you know a lot of your tolls have got uh, you know uh, the car, the e cards and the uh, fact that they get directly deducted uh, from your bank accounts so i think they're making a lot of changes uh, i still feel that you know the way the mnc's adopt and make change uh, you know it's still a long way for government organizations to move at that fast pace i think sometimes age also play a lot big role see in a lot of mnc's an average age or you know the demographics of uh, millennials is a lot higher than obviously you know the age it you know a lot 50 to 60 year of population which also makes it you know very easy for an mnc to adopt to a changing environment uh with with in a government setup you will see uh, you know a lot of people are between 40 to 60 years of age that also again you know plays a very difficult challenge for them to adopt to a laptop or hybrid or a work from home they still used to a lot of filing system which obviously in a corporate world is a very simple e files right i don't remember uh, in my last 12 years any organization maintaining physical files i mean they do maintain but it's not so you know we don't refer to physical files we always refer to e files uh, uh, in a government jobs you still maintain physical files i mean i still remember if i go to my college or university like a rajasthan university uh, i still remember they maintain files of you know your database and they will go and look for that file open up that file if they have to give you a no do certificate or even to give you a another uh, degree uh, to you they will open that then ask somebody to sign and then ask somebody to print and then give you that physical copy rather than just having a e system i'm sure they they are doing a lot, lot of it i think they're still a, lo- a lot far away to thinking hybrid and technology adoption uh, i don't think so they are very close to any mnc's they they are not close to mnc's i would i and i'm being honest about this um so a question from pallavi uh, she is asking how to create a sense of teamwork and trust while working in a remote environment great uh so if you are a people manager or you know you are at a you know leadership uh, role i would say that trust is a two way street right you know you can't you know just build trust by saying hey i trust you you know it never works you know the more you say i trust you the more the individual will step back and say oh there's something wrong <laughs> so i think trust will the first thing of a trusted relation is knowing each other so you know take and spend time to know the individual personally and i say not personally saying oh this is a kid and this is what he eats and all that stuff and i say personally know that personality type what works for that individual what doesn't work for that individual what is the career aspiration of that individual you know take time to understand that individual before you even say this is the work this is the timeline so that's it if you want that relationship that will also work but then don't expect the same thing from the individual as well right so if you genuinely want to build trust take time to understand be open for different ideas because every individual is different right if you build a team of five or more trust me not five will work according to what you want you know they all will be different their working styles will be different their emotional level will diff- will be different their energies will be different uh the way they give the same result is also going to be different so think about that uh you know my easy way is the moment i you know start with a new team member or start a new team i always start by you know, i have created my own checklist of saying how will i get to know this individual better which is saying what is the mode of communication that works it is a email communication or is it a call that the person works with better or you know what works for the individual as a communication style what is completely no no for an individual know that do you even know that for your team member that what is something that the person just completely hate uh i mean have you even spent time enough for an individual to know that so do that and share about you as well hey this is my style this is what i like this is i don't like so that the team also know at the start that hey i know what my boss like and what my boss is like so that they also start to you know adopt adapt to your working style the second piece of trust is you have to give space to the individual and i always say that you know micromanagement never helps 
never helps to an individual unless and until you're putting a person on a PIP or the person is completely not able to come to a performance that you are expected. I think except for those two scenarios, necro management, you know, your your team is a millennial, your team is, you know, a Gen, Gen Z, you know, they just don't like micromanaging. Let give them space to operate. expect the result don't expect how are they doing it obviously they have to follow an ethical way and a process to do it if you feel something is wrong obviously ask questions i'm not saying don't ask question but don't you know every hour pester them hey are you going to give me this don't every hour say oh this is the exactly 10 steps that you need to follow unless and until you have signed a deal with the client that this is exactly the 10 ways that you have to support to do things beyond that you know be flexible the and the third most important thing is uh, you know be genuinely give uh, you know your associate uh, you know don't think that you know the associate will spend all oh, the work hours is 10 hours the person has to spend 10 hours you know gone are the days that you know we are worried about the time that the individual spend in you should be more about you know oh what's the out now the person works at 7 am in the morning the person works 10 am in the morning or 10 pm in the night till the time you know that by this deadline you are supposed to get this and the person is giving don't worry about the 9 hours 5 hours 4 hours at the individual is work stop doing that you know nobody likes to do that you know there are days that i work 13 hours 14 hours there are days when you know my productivity is extremely low because i've already slogged myself for last 10 days so i do expect those kind of a breathing space for myself rather than somebody guiding me that oh every day you are supposed to be 9 hours at work so i think you know you you know ex- the way that you expect your boss to deal with you ex- do the same thing with your team you know think that way always this is i like my boss to do for me you know do the same thing for your team i think that's the only way for having managing the trusted relationship uh, in the hybrid model so uh, mega we're going to take the last question uh, for the day uh, so take this one uh, how does working from home affect psychological health what can employers do to make sure that people are staying focused committed and happy uh so i think uh see again you know i'll start with the fact okay there is also a study around you know emotional mental and physical well being and uh, the more emotional mental and physically you know and employer employee is happy the more productive they are going to be the less leaves they are going to take and the more productive uh, outcomes that they are going to provide from a workplace standpoint so there is enough study around there as well uh, and i think organizations have started to realize and understand that and in a hybrid or pandemic era i think multiple organizations have focused a lot around emotional physical psychological safety needs of the associate now whether it's the eap surveys whether it's you know doing multiple webinars or wellbeing sessions to you know introducing mobile applications for physical uh, safety for people to multiple things to vaccination drives to other, multiple things most of things that the organization have started to do i think the biggest challenge still organization faces is the fact that you know well being is very very personal to each of us right you know there might be 10 well being sessions that happen in the organization but i still chose to attend none of them and maybe want to have something of my own and well being is a very very personal choice to individual i think in india we still as employees don't you know spend enough quality time out on our own well being whether it's healthy eating whether it's healthy uh, environment that we create among ourselves to even you know physically you know being very active and that's also you know a cultural uh, background for us to say that oh my god you know if you go to gym you know your parents will start to say oh, why are you gyming you are fine you know you don't have to create a body that's a, you know that's the you know emotional baggage that we have uh, that has been created culturally within all of us uh, i think you know uh, while organization can only take you enough and you know there's a saying that you can take the horse to the water but uh, you know you can't make them drink unless you completely drown the horse into the lake itself so i think it's that saying you know till the time the associate takes themselves and if employees understand you know that they need to take care of themselves 
I don't think so. Organization can do beyond the point, which means organization can create flexible work hours. Organization can create policies to be flexible. Organization can design different well-being, physical, emotional portfolio, right from applications to seminars to well-being sessions to uh, vaccination drive. But if you have to take a vaccine, only then the vaccination drive is going to be successful, right? Uh, organization can only arrange it. They can't mandate it to go and take a vaccine. Uh, organizations can. you know create a you know tie up with a fortis hospital or any other hospital and provide you 24 by 7 remote application support that the hospital can have but it's on you to leverage that right organization can give you a counselor uh, can support you into an emotional trauma but it's only you to make that call i think it's a again a win win story will only happen when you start to take your well being seriously otherwise organization will continue to invest but uh, won't reap the results of what what they actually hope for mega so uh, we started uh, when we talking about uh, when we were talking about interview uh, how to uh, do well in interviews and uh, i guess it's only fair to circle back to say two things so vipresha has a question uh, she is asking in an interview how do we understand the intrinsic culture of a company great i hope it means uh, a remote interview absolutely and i i'm assuming in the current setup so i would say uh, you know the first thing is uh, at least for most of the junior and middle level position you will always have a jd unless and until it's a senior level it's a new role i do get it but at least at that level you will always have a jd most of all 80% of the time they will mention a culture of the organization how the how they expect the culture to be read that it's very important because when you read that you can tone your interview on what you answer based on that so my first step of guiding is read what's written on the jd and read between the line what the person has written if the if jd says that you know we look for aggressive uh, you know fast paced environment which means they will move very fast they don't need people to sit on a decision and you know expect the change to happen in 2 weeks they might be changing very very fast from a culture uh, which means that's the cultural sense that you will get when you read the jd uh the second piece uh ask the interview interviewer will always leave last 10 minutes or 5 minutes for you to ask question ask that can you give me an insight about what's the organization culture you must ask and not just one whether it's the recruiter whether it's the functional round whether it's the leader whether it's the hr round. ask that question and trust me the moment you ask that the person will give you an example and talk about how the culture of the organization organization is that's the safest question to ask honestly that's the safest question to ask because the moment you ask the question the interviewer also get hey this person is serious about this interview and this person genuinely wants to join the organization and hence is asking about the culture of the organization that also gives a hint to the interviewer that okay she's asking the culture which means it is important to us as her as a personality so let me share you know how do i operate how does the organization operate and how do i expect you to operate in this organization which is a great thing for you because then you not just know how this organization operate but you also know how is will the organization expect you to work or uh, you know from a uh, cultural nuances standpoint so uh, i would encourage ask this question and ask to all interviews uh, interview in the same organization that you go through ask to multiple different people and connect that story to say what was the common theme coming across what is something that came out from hr but didn't came out from the functional round which means as a team there might be something that is you know more expected versus less expected that made a lot of sense yeah uh, vipresha was talking about the virtual interview she mentioned in chat so this brings us to the end of the session uh, mega this was a uh, really nice uh, uh, this was a really informative session for all of us and uh, uh, so Thank you so much, Mega. Thank you uh, for taking out time to do this today, and uh, uh, we really appreciate this. Uh, I'd like to thank all our learners from uh, Eruditus and Emeritus uh, for taking out time to attend this session. Uh, we wish everyone a very happy weekend. Uh, okay.
Dr. Shalja Shekhar has a question. Uh, she will be in the chat. She, uh, she wants to speak. Should we open this? Amiga, shall we open this? Absolutely, why not? I mean, I can spend another five minutes with you all. I think very, very interactive session, and I love some sessions where audience ask uh, you know open questions. So absolutely, why not? And people, you know, I know it's very late. People who want to drop, absolutely feel free to drop. You can reach out to me directly on my LinkedIn. Uh, you know, ping me, message me. I would be very happy to answer if you have any further questions. Doctor Selja, go ahead. So, uh, I guess Dr. Shalja is mentioning the question in the chat also. Um, how do I ensure I am driving the interview being the candidate? Sometimes the interviewer continuously puts up questions. Okay, great. Uh, and that happens a lot of time, Shalja. And I'm sure you know you would face, especially from a functional domain round, you know, one question after another. Now to think about, you know, uh, not sure how many of you know, but there are different type of interviews, right? And one of the type is stress interviews. And usually, when the interview is putting a lot of question one after the another, he's basically trying to stress the. You know, he's typically taking a stress interview, tries to understand how do you behave in a stressful situation because sometimes in an organization that also happens depending on what organization that you're going for. So if the interviewer is doing that, the first thing that you have to do is calm yourself. Let him ask, you know, that's the opportunity that you have to showcase of what you have. What maximum is going to happen? You're going to fail that. That's it. That's the maximum thing that you have to say. And you know, every time you face such kind of an interview, you always have to step back and say, at max, I'm going to fail this now. That's all it's going to take, right? I know it may be for somebody a career, it may be for somebody, oh my God, I lost an opportunity. I get that. But imagine you didn't have that. You don't have it after that 30 minutes as well. But you don't have to for that, you know, keep your blood pressure high or get nervous or you know forget things that you were supposed to answer first of all you have to be emotionally very very settled because that's the first thing that the interviewer is trying to see how do you respond to a stressful situation that's what the interview is trying to do when you ask what's the complete question the second thing that you have to understand if the interviewer is asking a question again and again or putting maximum questions that means he want very very short question answers from you and very very crisp rather than having a lengthy questions so you know that's also a hint for you to uh, take that the moment the interviewer is doing that you know come down to one sentence of answers or two sentences of answers rather than you know giving long five minute answers or 10 minutes answer this is a second tip for you in such kind of an interview the third tip you know again you know remember interviewer will continuously ask you question as a follow-up on your last response so think prep yourself before that question where do you want your career trajectory to be focused on you know you have five years you have two years or you have no career history but think about what are the experiences that you want to share and always stick back to those responses responses are in your hand responses are not in the interviewer hands and a follow-up question will always come from the responses that you share so prep about your experiences what 10 experiences that i'm very very sure about that i want to talk about and pick about from the situations among those 10 responses that you want to give your follow-up questions will always come from the responses so you are prepped and you are again guiding the interviewer to say what you want to ask so you you know i always say interview is never about what interview wants to know it's about what you want to tell in the interview And Dr. Shelja, when you know you faced that interview wanted you to elaborate on every answer, which means you were sharing the opposite of it, which means extremely short answers, but rather the interviewer wants you to understand the same technique. Why did you do something? What was the problem statement? What did you achieve? And what was the outcome? Talk about success measures. You know, the biggest 
mistake that indians and i'm saying culturally as a indian we don't talk about outcome you know we don't talk about success measures what did that project lead to what was the success that you achieved what was the you know talk in numerical values 30% of the attrition you know gone down because i did x engagement activity with that team i did that because there was an attrition of 30% now due to that we built 10 engagement models uh, this is the challenge we faced during building those engagement models this is how i solved for that engagement model over a period of 8 months and because of that our attrition from 30% went down to 25% now imagine i gave you the entire length and breadth of it now if the interviewer is going to ask me will ask me from these 10 things will not go beyond this boundary i already fixed the boundary for them oh was 30% the industry one or was the 30% not the industry one so that is going to be the follow up question but the interview got the length and breadth he got the challenge he got the achievement he got my learning he also got my success measures i think a lot of time we don't talk about outcomes as the most important thing to give to an interviewer Just mentioning that she cleared the interview, but it was very tiring. Stress interviews are always tiring because that's the emotional toll that they're supposed to take. That's why they're stress interviews, right? But as I said, you know, just think about at max you're not going to clear it, so there's no harm. Don't lose your cool over it. Don't lose your uh, one and a half is a very good thing, Shelda. You know, if an interviewer is spending anything beyond then the scheduled time, that means the interviewer is invested in you. always remember that the interview will never go beyond the you know scheduled time if the person has not liked it. so if it is going over you know that's a hint for you to spend more time into your answers give them more uh, about what they're asking because anything that's more than the scheduled hours that means interviewer genuinely is wanting to know more maybe if they have not got enough material in the 60 minutes or 30 minutes that was the scheduled time and they still want to know more because they like you so that's also another hint for you to understand that uh one and a half hours i think uh, dr shelja as you go in the more in the hierarchy uh you know i don't, and i don't know you personally but i would say the more uh that you you know go into the leadership roles the interviewers are going to be 60 minutes 90 minutes even sometimes 2 hours because the person only you know wants to be very very sure for the leader that they're hiring uh, so that's how it is i think for one and a half hours uh, i would say uh, hats off to you to manage that conversation especially on a stress interview uh, but i would say that you know that's a great uh, piece for you to you know go at a one and a half hours reflect on your how did you do well not did you not do well maybe next time if the same questions come in to you how would you respond it better uh, i think each one of us should experience one stress interview at least because uh, uh, you would somewhere in your career history always face that and you know reflect how would you deal with a similar situation uh, again differently so that next time when it happens to you you are more prepped for it thank you for uh, sharing all these uh, tips and uh, all your experiences and with us and uh, it was really great to have you here on our session and uh, uh, thank you for taking up time again and uh, we wish uh, a very happy weekend to everyone thank you and hope you all have a great weekend and thank you so much uh, for having me here i mean i, I really enjoyed the session